Good afternoon and welcome to today's MDA industry webinar sponsored by Hillrom. My name is Dan Schmiel and I'm a senior global product manager here at Hillrom based in St. Paul, Minnesota. Today's topic is hospital proven airway clearance, oscillation and lung expansion now available in the home. Joining me today is Dr. John Perpich from St. Joseph's Children's Hospital in Tampa, Florida. So I'm going to be providing you with an overview of oscillation and lung expansion therapy, specifically introducing you to the new Valera device. And then Dr. Perpich will talk about his experience clinically with oscillation and lung expansion, both inpatient and now in the home. Thank you all for being here. So you may be familiar with oscillation and lung expansion in the form of the Metaneb device. And here's the Metaneb system. It's been available inpatient for roughly the last seven years. And it delivers oscillation and lung expansion therapy in the form of continuous positive expiratory pressure, continuous high frequency oscillation, and then the aerosol mode. So three, three therapies in one are delivered with the Metaneb system. But over the last seven years of its, of its availability inpatient, clinicians and patients have been asking for this therapy to be available in the home. And so that's why we've spent the last five to seven years working on bringing this OLE oscillation and lung expansion therapy to you in both the hospital and the home. So this is the Valera oscillation and lung expansion uh, device. You can see it looks very different than Metaneb. However, it delivers the exact same therapy, oscillation and lung expansion therapy, but it does so across the continuum of care. So now we have this therapy available for your patients inpatient and also in the home. And we do that through an electromechanical device. So the device itself is electromechanical, which allows us to deliver those same proven outcomes of the OLE system therapy inpatient with uh, more precision and versatility. It has a digital touch screen and it's going, to, it's going to display the therapy to the patient as it's being delivered. And then on the left side, it, there's a digital manometer that's continuously monitoring the peak and mean pressure delivered to the patient. And this is done through very precise sensing technology internal to the device. The device also will deliver pressure up to 50 centimeters of water pressure in CHFO in, in the home and 70 centimeters of water pressure uh, inpatient. And, you know, the, the Metaneb device, it was a pneumatic device or is a pneumatic device. So it's powered by wall oxygen, whereas the Valera system is um, uh, microelectronics. And so it's, it's powered by wall uh, current or a rechargeable battery for improved versatility. What makes it also very different for patients in the home is the fact that you as a, a clinician can prescribe a set therapy for the patient in the automatic mode. And this makes it very easy for the patient to access their therapy, take their therapy and receive the exact same therapy each time. So let's look at patient interfaces. For spontaneous breathing patients, they can take it, the therapy either through a mouthpiece face mask or through their tracheostomy. And then also, if they're on a ventilator, we have a setup for patients receiving this therapy on a ventilator. So let's take a, a little closer look at the three-in-one therapy delivered by oscillation and lung expansion therapy. The first therapy segment is the continuous positive expiratory pressure. Here we're delivering that CPEP from five centimeters of pressure all the way up to 25, uh, so you can select within that range. Here we're providing that positive expiratory pressure deep into the distal airways, opening up those airways. That typically is a two and a half minute therapy and followed by continuous high frequency oscillation. Here we're providing oscillations anywhere from five to 50 uh, centimeters of pressure in the home and then inpatient it's up to 70. So after the patient receives the positive expiratory pressure, we follow that with these pressure pulses that gently remove the secretions into the central airways. During both of these modes, 
aerosol, uh, nebulization can, can occur. So you have that three in one therapy. And you know, the one key difference here with this de device is that you're providing internal oscillation, internal continuous uh, positive expiratory pressure, and you're really getting into those distal airways. And uh, that's been you know, the success of oscillation and lung expansion in patients as well. So intended use is for mobilization of secretions, lung expansion therapy, the treatment and prevention of pulmonary atelectasis, and also has the ability to provide supplemental oxygen. And the patient populations uh, that it's intended for are adults and children down to the age of two in the acute care, and then in the home care setting down to age five. So oscillation and lung expansion therapy has been available and, and is used inpatient, it has been for years. And some of the key areas it's used is emergency department, ICU to reduce length of time on a ventilator, length of stay in the ICU, post-surgical units to reduce post-pulmonary -pulm complications and reduce length of stay. And then of course in the general med surge floors to reduce length of stay, and provide that lung expansion and improved atelectasis. But now this oscillation therapy is available in the home. So some patients that might benefit from, benefit from OLE therapy specific to neuromuscular diseases and conditions are patients that have risk factors associated with um, uh, respiratory muscle weakness, aspiration, impaired cough, retained secretions, mucus plugging, airway obstruction, chronic inflammation, and decreased lung volumes. And these results, as we all know, in chronic infection, aspiration pneumonia, bronchiectasis, atelectasis, recurrent hospitalizations, which is always a focus, and then increased uh, healthcare utilization. Generally, patients that might benefit beyond neuromuscular are patients that have excessive secretions, retained secretions, mucus plugging, airway obstruction, and chronic inf inflammation. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Uh, Perpich uh, from uh, Tampa, Florida. He's the medical director for pediatric pulmonary and respiratory care at St. Joseph's Children's Hospital. He also has a clinic practice uh, in, at pediatric specialists and he's a clinical so, uh, assistant professor at the University of Southern Florida. So I'm gonna quick move to your slides, Dr. Purpose. So just give me a moment here. Sure. All right, can you see that, Dr. Perpich? I can. I think um, it's one slide four. I think we need to go back. There we go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, all right. So all I'll right. turn it over to you, Dr. Perpich. Sorry for the delay there. Oh, no, no. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, calling in or you know, signing in with your computer. Uh, hopefully, <clears throat> I can provide some, some clinical insight in, in my experience with, with OLE therapy, which is, has been for quite some time, especially on the hospital side. Uh, but now in the home as well, and it's been it's been pretty exciting. And I, you know, I I've done some talks on airway clearance um, uh, in the past, and and so I thought just to kind of frame my own uh, uh, presentation, it might be good to to review. Uh, I'm sure all of everyone on the phone call is pretty aware of what the goals of airway clearance are, right? I mean, we're trying to move uh, uh, and eliminate these obstructing secretions from the airway. Uh, you know, our airways are constantly making that thin layer of mucus and, and secretions, uh, and, and we have built-in mechanisms to get rid of it, but in m many uh, disease states or often surgery or pain medicine or, 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 or reasons, you know, due to pain that sometimes the clearance of, that, of those secretions can become impaired. Um, the problem is that we, we want to decrease the consequence of those secretions if they can't be moved in a timely manner, such as inflammation and infection. Uh, airway obstruction and hypoxemia. Uh, and we want to support that healthy environment with the airway so that we can support appropriate oxygenation and ventilation 
really improve work of breathing, and especially in our neuromuscular patients, maybe decrease that work of breathing if we're able to uh, alter the lung compliance and the and chest wall compliance, uh, which can really help them. And then, of course, prevent uh, infection. Next slide. And so I'm a pediatric pulmonologist, right? And I think it's important, too, to recognize that in that population, they're very different, right? They're not just little adults. Um, <clears throat> one of the important things is that they have a much more compliant chest wall, and so often they're breathing much lower and, and closer to FRC, and so they're much more prone to atelectasis. Uh, also, uh, um, their airways are much smaller, and they have less of that, of that kind of cartilaginous support, and so often that alone also puts them at increased risk for atelectasis or uh, airway plugging with smaller amounts of mucus. Um, one of the, the results, unfortunately, you know, they have less collateral ventilation as well. And so if they do get areas that are collapsed, they have a harder time re-expanding those uh, uh, areas uh, and, and clearing those obstructive secretions. Because remember, in order to effectively clear mucus, you need to be able to get air around and behind the mucus. Um, and so for a cough to really be effective, uh, you've got to be able to get air around and behind it. And so if they're not able to do that on their own, often that will get in the way. And then you know, depending on the age, but really across a lot of age ranges, they tend to be less cooperative. They tend to be more scared. They have a harder time following commands and doing what you want to do when you want them to do it. And then our risk of reflux and aspiration uh, is always present as well. And that often makes some of our, our uh, typical airway clearance maneuvers, especially postural drainage, much more challenging. Next slide. And so, you know, you've heard it uh, uh, in some of the slides talking about indications for, uh, for you know, metaneb and for OLE therapy, uh, but one of the biggest things is, is to minimize and address atelectasis, right? That complete or partial collapse of a, of a lung or a very small or a very large section of that lung. And, and like I said, it can, it can really impact a very small section or a large section. And usually it's, it's often due to obstruction of that bronchial lumen, right? That's going to be the most common, T tends to be from secretions, but we can't forget there can be external compression, whether that's related to cardiomegaly in some of my congenital heart kids or patients that are in cardiac, uh, you know, that, that have CHF. Uh, and our patients that have significant neuromuscular weakness that can have airway collapse. They can have tracheomalacia, significant bronchomalacia. Um, and then patients, especially in the post-operative setting, are going to have splinting um, uh, relative to their surgery or relative to other things, maybe a chest tube's in place. And so they're going to be splinting to the pain meds and not taking that typical uh, tidal volume, that, that typical respiratory effort that, that you or I would. And then our patients that often have neuromuscular challenges often also have uh, scoliosis. Or, and then we have other patients that have other musculoskeletal deformities that impair that normal symmetrical movement and expansion of the lungs, as well as the effectiveness of the diaphragm uh, to expand and, and, and recruit and, and inflate the lung as well. And then depending upon certain disease states that we may deal with, you may have reduced surface tension. And then when you get areas that are atelectatic, sometimes you're battling against that reduced surface tension in, in terms of trying to re-expand. And all of this uh, is important because once you get areas that are atelectatic, then your body's going to try to do its best to match ventilation to perfusion. Um, but sometimes it's not always so good at that, and you end up with hypoxemia. Uh, and then sometimes if there's large areas of atelectasis or even small areas that may impact things like pulmonary pressures and, and be a risk for pulmonary hypertension. Next slide. And sometimes you may not see them. Sometimes you can have very small subsegmental areas on the X-ray, and then sometimes they're very obvious. Uh, but if they're not re-expanded in a timely manner, we worry that ongoing retention of secretions can lead to inflammation uh, and uh, can be a risk for infection and long-term can be a source for lung damage in those areas. Uh, and we ultimately end up with bronchiectasis, which then starts a kind of a vicious cycle of ongoing infection and worsening impaired mucus clearance in those areas that become bronchiect bronchiectatic. And then you can also deal with hypoxemia. Uh, next slide. And so, you know, neuromuscular disease is probably a, a, is a large area where we often deal with impaired secretion clearance over the, the life of the patient, uh, depending upon the condition we're dealing with, whether it's progressive or static, that, that those may change over time. Um, and then things about the patient may also change in terms of scoliosis or, or a growth or, or other issues. But this, this slide just sort of kind of highlights all the different ways that the different types of neuromuscular diseases that we may see can impact uh, uh, airway clearance in different ways from impacting cough efficacy, cough coordination, vocal cord control, airway tone, muscle strength, <clears throat> ability to take those large deep breaths in terms of lung recruitment and tidal volume, diaphragm function, 
uh, um, and then just overall, you know, uh, uh, strength and, 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 and ability to get up and stand and move and, and sit and all the things that we take for granted. Next slide. Ne next slide. And those, these things that affect our neuromuscular patients affect them in different ways in a, in a combination of different ways, right? And so they often do result in not just one uh, challenge, but they do result in uh, difficulties taking big breaths in, difficulties taking or, or, or giving a good forceful exhalation. Um, that's going to uh, you know, result in cough dysfunction. It's going to put them at increased risk for pneumonia. Uh, it may result in some upper airway dysfunction and upper airway obstruction and, and further collapse that further results in retention of secretions. They may end up with some secondary tracheomalacia that also ends up with retention of secretions and then end up with difficulty at night with sleep disorder breathing and CO2 retention and hypoxemia as well. And, and that just, they all, all of these things just kind of feed in together uh, to often make the patient um, a little more complicated than just one issue. Next, next slide. And so, you know, I had mentioned scoliosis that we often will see in some of our um, neurologically uh, uh, impaired patients. Uh, um, this is a picture of a young lady I took care of who had uh, spastic cerebral palsy and a pretty significant uh, scoliosis. And because of that, and as that scoliosis progressed over time, we ended up with more significant atelectasis over on that left side. And of course, it also impacted her ability for a uh, good effective cough in terms of the way the diaphragms are supposed to contract and expand and, and she ended up with recurrent pneumonias and would often end up with augmented secretion clearance at the, in the home um, uh, at times when she was sick. But what often happens with these kids is that orthopedic doctors get involved and next slide. And we can help, right? So the orthopedic doctors can do spinal fusion, but then that creates another set of problems afterwards, especially in the acute care setting where often they're gonna have problems with atelectasis and they're gonna, they may have problems with pneumonia. And, and one of the areas that we've had a lot of success uh, and a lot of utility uh, uh, using OLE therapy in the hospital is trying to help our orthopedic and pediatric surgeons uh, have better outcomes. And so they, you know, they really don't want to have post-operative pneumonias. They, uh, um, it ends up creating a whole, a list of, of, of challenges with the hospital in terms of fallouts for those you know, post-operative pneumonias. And so we have uh, um, been working with uh, our respiratory therapists and, and on, on the hospital side, creating sort of an assessment tool. And, and often, so we, we will see all these patients beforehand also to give pulmonary clearance so that we can try to identify who are those patients that we need to be more aggressive with secretion clearance uh, and that acute post-operative uh, uh, period so that we can help minimize uh, problems with atelectasis due to pain and, and, and retain secretions. And often, you know, it, it, after a spinal fusion, we're not going to be able to do any kind of external chest physiotherapy. We're not going to be able to do any chest wall oscillation, but we can do something like OLE, which can really help with minimizing uh, um, atelectasis and helping with lung expansion and secretion clearance, um, but yet still be tolerable from a pain standpoint and orthopedic doctors allow us to do it. And so we've been very successful at helping to minimize and prevent some of those post-operative complications, but also shorten duration of stay in the hospital. And they've, uh, and then also, like I said, you minimize pneumonia, which they've appreciated greatly. Next slide. Um, another sort of skeletal or, or you know, um, musculoskeletal reason uh, that sometimes we will run into are uh, patients with uh, chest wall deformities. Uh, I had a patient with June syndrome, which is a you know, pretty rare disorder with uh, marked by small chest and shortened ribs. And they end up with this very restrictive bell-shaped chest, um, which does not grow as they grow. And it's often called asphyxiating thoracic dystrophy. And it's pretty rare, but um, it really, especially as a child grows, can be a problem. And so next slide. This young man ended up, you know, also seeing the um, orthopedic docs and got these expanding rods placed. Uh, which helped the chest wall grow like it's supposed to, but this is an ongoing uh, uh, course. I mean, I mean, ongoing treatment that re that requires um, multiple uh, adjustments to these expanding rods over time, and those each of those adjustments and and the post-operative course is often uh, complicated with pain and discomfort and difficulty in terms of his own ability to cough and clear secretions, and he did ultimately end up requiring a tracheostomy. Um, but he did need a lot of help with secretion clearance. And because of these rods and the pain, we weren't, he was not able to receive anything external like manual chest physiotherapy or, the, or um, external chest wall oscillation. But he did very well uh, with uh, um, OLE therapy. And that really helped uh, at least, especially during those acute episodes, uh, to help minimize uh, um, any complications. 
when when we were taking care of him, this was before we had the home version, so we weren't able to do it in, in the home with him, but it really helped him on the inpatient side. Next slide. And, you know, so a non-neuromuscular patient, but I do think that it's, a, um, it's an important, and I've had actually um, um, kind of a growing list of, of successes is patients that get admitted uh, to the floor for acute chest syndrome. <clears throat> for those that um, are not aware, so acute chest syndrome is in patients that happen with, you know, sickle cell anemia, and they present with uh, often in a um, chest pain with a vaso-occlusive crisis, and then they develop a new infiltrate on x-ray. Usually it's accompanied by fever and cough. They may have uh, increased sputum production and they often end up hypoxemic and short of breath. And, and these patients can progress very rapidly and often end up in the ICU, uh, um, even secondary to the acute chest syndrome. And if they have asthma, they're at increased risk for it. And a lot of times it's non-infectious and more related to either the pain medicines they're getting for their pain crises or it might be related to a fat embolism or you know, secondary to asthma and atelectasis. But it is marked by significant atelectasis on the x-rays. And so uh, um, this population uh, right now, sort of standard of care often when they get admitted is they get an incentive in spirometry, which they don't ever do unless you're sitting in the room with them. Uh, but I've had a lot of success, especially if I get consulted early enough, um, where the early in the chest x-ray changes before they really are having significant difficulty uh, at reversing this and, and uh, really have had very few, if any, of the patients required transfer to the ICU because we're able to turn around the atelectasis pretty quickly. Next slide. And so you can see this is that same patient uh, who was receiving uh, um, albuterol and antibiotics prior to the changes on the x-ray, and then really just two days later, still getting their antibiotics and their albuterol, but we added in the, um, the OLE therapy, and you can see the improvement in the atelectasis uh, and the patient ended up not requiring the ICU and, and was able to be managed on the floor and, and did well. Uh, and so I, the, this, this population is, I, uh, I feel very well suited. And there's, you know, a group of, of these patients that will get recurrent acute chest and they'll come in very frequently to the hospital uh, um, for episodes with abnormal x-rays and atelectasis. And, and uh, uh, I think it just speaks once again to the power of OLE in terms of atelectasis and, and managing uh, secretion clearance. Next slide. Dr. Perpich, sorry if yeah. I can jump in real quick. Yeah. So you, you mentioned some of these patients are having, you know, frequent hospitalizations. Would you consider that situation or that patient for OLE in the home? Is that? Absolutely. And so actually, I, I just were um, just ordered one for a patient today <laughs> that was um, that has been she just had been sent home uh, like a week ago and then just got readmitted again. Uh, with return of, of a pain crisis and, and was back on oxygen and didn't look horrible, but just that she's been in the hospital, I can't even count how many times. And she's got pretty significant asthma as well. But, um, you know, it, it uh, so, uh, you know, if we can prevent these episodes, if we can help uh, control <clears throat> um, and, you know, in the home setting, you know, help to augment secretion clearance and prevent atelectasis, it would be really nice if we can prevent and break this cycle. And so I think that, you know, one of the ideas is that uh, a lot of these cases that I brought up it has been around the acute management of a problem, you know, brought to you uh, when they're sick or with an abnormal x-ray or they're already having problems. But one of the major roles for OLE therapy is also in sort of maintenance of, of pulmonary health and, 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 you know, preventing problems from happening. And that's really where I think the home use of OLE therapy shines, right, to, to try to help augment and, and prevent these issues or an augment secretion clearance when they're healthy uh, to prevent problems that result in hospitalization. Next slide. And so I, this is just another example that um, I thought was kind of interesting uh, in terms of the atelectasis component as, as well. This was a 16-year-old. I'm not sure why a 16-year-old was playing on a slip and slide, but she was. And so at the time, she did not know it, but she also had a pancreatic cyst, and so she was playing on the slip and slide and ended up uh, rupturing uh, that cyst. And so ended up with uh, a partial pancreatic resec resection with a drain place and had a pretty significant pain associated with it, um, you know, because of the drain and, and was complaining of some chest pain that was radiating to her shoulder, which makes us sometimes often think about it um, either an effusion or, or you know, something from a pulmonary standpoint. She did not have any fever. She had no cough and she had no significant tachypnea, but the radiologist read this x-ray as left lower lobe infiltrate with a small associated effusion. Um, but she didn't have any of the other symptoms that we would see with a pneumonia, right? Very often they have tachypnea. They very often will have pneumonia. And, um, and this is another example of, you know, she had just had recent surgery. And so the 
you know, the surgeons were worried if this was a post-operative pneumonia. Um, however, because of her pain and splinting, she was not really coughing and she really was exhibiting pretty poor effort and, and poor lung expansion. So next slide. And so uh, just after two days of receiving uh, OLE therapy uh, uh, throughout the day with albuterol, you can see that that area cleared up in a much more prompt manner than you would expect a standard pneumonia to clear up. And so <clears throat> it, it uh, helped us get her out of the hospital faster, helped us control her chest pain better because she was not having that, that chest pain anymore, but then also avoided a lengthy course of antibiotics, which may have had other side effects or problems as well. And so it's, it's, been, uh, um, it's been very helpful at, at sort of clearing the waters, if you will, in some of these kids where you really don't think they have pneumonia that's more related to atelectasis. Next slide. And so, I, you know, I'm also part of our aerodigestive team here at the hospital. So we do a lot of bronchoscopies in conjunction with our ear, nose, and throat colleagues and our GI doctors. And, um, and in the neuromuscular population especially, but even in patients that have other uh, uh, issues, this is, a, this is a teenager with asthma um, who had a vascular ring repaired when he was younger. And overall, had been doing pretty good. But recently, his asthma has been kind of off the rails, and he's been having more problems with cough. And, and so I, I uh, um, wanted to, to see just knowing his history of a vascular ring, he was increased risk for some tracheomalation. This is a bronch that was done pretty recently. And you can see really on several of these slides, up, so up at the top uh, left of your, of your slide is an example of normal for those people that don't spend a lot of time in people's airways, but a normal airway really should have those C-shaped cartilaginous rings, right? So this picture's probably right below the subglottic space. You've gone right below the vocal cords. You're in the very early part of the trachea, but you can see that that trachea is very open. You have that posterior, uh, a wall of the trachea with the with the the um, muscular component. So the remember the cartilaginous. We always say uh, cartilaginous rings, but they're not rings. They're they're in the letter of a C with an opening at the back, uh, and there's a strip of muscle that runs down that the back of that of the trachea. And normally when we cough, there's going to be some collapse, but there shouldn't be a significant amount of collapse. And you can see, like for instance, in image nine. So this was a um, he was coughing some while I was in the airway, and there's almost complete AP collapse. And in, in image ten, it's even worse. Uh, uh, where that trachea really just collapses. And, and the, the problem when we have patients with tracheomalacia is that the, in order to have an effective cough, in order to effectively clear secretions, it ha things have to happen in a certain order. Uh, and you really need to be able to take those big deep breaths. You need to be able to get air around behind any, uh, any mucus that may be present. You've got to build up that pressure against closed vocal cords. Uh, and then in a coordinated manner, you have to exhale that air as you open those vocal cords and you, and you deliver that cough. And then the airways need to stay open, at least the proximal airways need to stay open so that the air can, can exit in a very rapid manner and the secretions can move from distal to more proximal. And if anything messes with that system, uh, uh, then things don't work quite so well. So if you have problems closing your vocal cords, if you have problems building up uh, the, the you know, pressure because of a neuromuscular weakness or, or diaphragm dysfunction, or if your airways are collapsing, whether it's neurogenic tracheomalacia or just tracheomalacia you were born with because you have a history of a vascular ring, but that the secretions are going to get trapped. So that cough is going to not be effective and mucus and secretions will be trapped. And it's, and it's a problem. And, and these are patients that don't tend to do quite as well with vest or with uh, uh, external com uh, um, chest therapy, because still in order to clear the secretions, they need to have that cough and their cough is trapping the secretions. And so this is a patient group that does very well with more of the positive pressure type maneuvers for airway clearance, such as OLE, um, because it's going to help stent open, especially those proximal airways, but the distal airways as well, to help with um, secretion clearance. But most importantly, this is a population that's going to do very well with regular use of OLE therapy in the home uh, as a preventative uh, um, to, to, to maintain, you know, uh, mucus clearance. Next slide. And so, I, you know, these were just a few cases that, uh, uh, across kind of a spectrum, but I, you know, just realizing that each patient is different and, and w how their uh, particular clinical uh, 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 case, you know, how it impacts their ability to clear secretions is going to be different. And, and really, I, you know, I like to sit and think about how uh, everything about that, that patient, whether it's their, their muscle weakness, whether it's their chest wall shape, whether it's the uh, uh, the different components of that coordination, whether there's it's their own internal awareness or, or ability to mount an effective cough um, and their ability to change or move positions. And so as, you're, as we're making these choices about ways to, to help with mucus clearance, you know, thinking about uh, um, uh, what it is that's impacting in that specific patient can be helpful. 
and of course when they're sick, but also remembering that these therapies are very helpful as a preventative when they're well. Thank you, Dr. Perpich. Very informative and, and uh, I love to, uh, to get this clinical experience and see this, thank you for that. And I have some questions, but I also want to make sure that we're answering the questions from the, the panel. And I, I meant to mention at the top of the hour, there is Q&A opportunity in the chat. And Michelle, let's see if there are any questions. I don't see any now, but let's give it a second for people to- so I have a question, Dr. Perpich, you and I have talked about this and that is the role of, of mechanical insufflation, exufflation for some of your patients um, versus, you know, as another option, OLE therapy for that lung expansion. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, your experiences with OLE for lung expansion? Sure. No, absolutely. So it, um, and actually I was the, um, I was actually just typing in the chat to say one of the, the things that I had meant to mention was just, you know, even some of the patient testimonials that I've, that I've received that are, that have OLE at home, um, uh, uh, specific around, uh, uh, lung expansion and around their ability to, to do better. Right. So I actually have a young lady who's actually impressively 18 and she has a condition called Lay syndrome, which really most, it's pretty impressive to be still alive at, at 18, but, but she has, you know, severe weakness. And has been through all of the different devices uh, that everyone is, is is aware of, and and was still requiring frequent admissions to the hospital, and, and was still requiring um it was was still having multiple pneumonia several times a year. And then once we were able to get the uh, outpatient use of of, of OLE uh, for her in the home, she literally was just a week ago or so she was she was on, in tears on the phone uh, about how much it's changed her life, and that this is the longest now that she's gone without being in the hospital and that, you know, they do it religiously several times a day and, and the girl is much more comfortable or cough is more effective in that they're, they're not needing the suction or nearly as much. Uh, and, but uh, just impressed by her the improvement in overall her, her affect and, and, and how she seems, but the amount of secretions that they're having to deal with on a daily basis. And then of course not requiring the hospital. And so, you know, it, uh, um, it's, I, you know, I think the, the, especially the patients that are in the home that are using it as a more preventative, you know, um, maneuver, since they're not sick, are going to be the ones that give us more of that feedback of just how much more comfortable it is when they're able to take those bigger breaths, when they're able to clear those secretions uh, um, out effectively um, and not have to work or not have to feel that, the, like, the, like the mucus or secretions are, are, are there on a chronic basis. Um, you know, uh, I think when we had talked earlier, there, there were, you know, videos of, of um, and often we would see patients with, you know, muscular dystrophy using uh, uh, positive pressure devices just to help with lung inflation, right? Just like the positive part of a, of a cough assist, just for that lung inflation, because we all have that, that un, sort of internal awareness of, of lung expansion. We, we have stretch receptors and, and it's uncomfortable if there's areas that are collapsed and if you, you know, are there and you can feel that mucus. Um, and so being able to do that uh, with, with OLE therapy is, 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 is you know, I, I think very advantageous. The, the only other story, actually, I, I don't know if I've ever told you, uh, Dan, but so when I was a pulmonary fellow, I took care of a young lady with cystic fibrosis who was actually a little bit older than me, um, but she refused to leave the pediatric center because she had grown up with us up there in Denver. And, um, and she actually was an employee at Hillrom and was an amazing sales rep. And I think everyone there at, at, at Hillrom knew her, but she was, she was the one who taught me a lot about mucus and because she was like a mucus ninja and was very aware of, of her. And, and she would do, she would teach kind of classes on secretion clearance and she would teach autogenic drainage. And she was, she would be able to maneuver and with huff coughs and, and, and sort of cycling her breathing and taking big breaths. She could move it. She could tell you where a mucus plug was and move it through her airways. Um, uh, in a very regimented manner until she was able to produce it. And it was just impressive to watch. And, you know, we would, she, she was amazing. And I was very, I was very blessed to get to know her both as a clinician, but just as a person. But she would speak ab about OLE therapy and about how she was able to uh, really feel, and she used to use the word mucus confusion um, to, to mix up some of the things that she was doing for her airway clearance. But she 
uh, I mean, I, I just put a lot of credence in, into her feedback because she was, I mean, she had lived this for her whole life and was so aware of her, of her mucus and, and, and her secretion. Thank you, Dr. Perpich. There's another question about experience in, in CF. So I'm going to mention something and then <clears throat> Dr. Perpich, if you can as well. So <clears throat> in my role as a global product manager, I work with a physiotherapist at, uh, in Melbourne, Australia, who's on the airway clearance panel for the European and North American CF uh, associations. Her name is Brenda Button. And so she has been using OLE therapy in, an, in her outpatient clinic on a series of uh, over 30 CF patients. And she just has had, and I can share this if we can get the, um, who's ever asking for this information, if, if Michelle, if I can follow up after and I can send that presentation that was presented at uh, the North American CF conference in 2018. But excellent results that she um, shared with the CF conference. Um, and then I know Dr. Perpich, you, you may have had some experience with CF as well. Absolutely. The, um, a, a lot of the experience I had had been on the inpatient side just because the availability as outpatient has not been until fairly recent. And then uh, to CF's credit, actually, you know, uh, with the uh, uh, advent of the home use of, of OLE therapy, we've also had the advent of some really groundbreaking treatments, other treatment options for our patients with CF that has really decreased a lot of their secretion burden, or at least clinically, they're, they're, uh, um, that has made a huge impact from a clinical standpoint. So, um, but I, you know, I would almost every single time, and when I would admit one of my patients to the hospital for a tune-up and would use uh, uh, OLE on an inpatient side, they would um, uh, constantly uh, um, ask and would beg me that they could go home with it. So it, it was, uh, uh, I mean, to a, to a T. So I think it, it's, you know, once again, that's a, it's a unique population that has such an, a, an acute awareness of how secretions affect their quality of life and then such an acute awareness of, um, of, of the presence of their mucus and, and of their secretions. And so, you know, I know, it, it's been, you know, like anything, I mean, when, you know, the, looking at studies and, and trials showing efficacy, it's very important that you've got to pick the right outcomes and the right outcome measures. And so hopefully over time, we're going to see more studies coming out looking at, you know, I feel at quality of life uh, measures and looking at a uh, bigger picture, long-term measures such as time to, you know, um, exacerbation or frequency of hospitalization as opposed to just inpatient metrics, because I think that's also where we're going to really see OLE shine. Thank you, Dr. Perpich, and I'm aware of sensitive to time, and I think we have answered the questions. Michelle, I think what we'll do now is just, first of all, a big hill round thank you, Dr. Perpich, to you and to the MBA, for, uh, and also to everyone that joined today. Thank you for the questions. That's, we, we'd love to see that. Thank you, everyone.